The MiG-25 and the MiG-31 are outstanding aeroplanes. Their performance is impressive, some say incomparable. They've been in service with the Russian Air Forces for a very long time. There have been moments of tragedy as well. Some distinguished test pilots lost their lives as mystery and espionage surrounded the aircraft. Separately, the story of each of these aircraft is fascinating, but the story of one is incomplete without the other. So their stories are inextricably linked, not just to each other, but to the history of aviation and indeed to the history of the whole country as well. It's important to note right at the start of this film that the MiG-31 was developed as a follow-up to the MiG-25. But whilst the MiG-25 had several roles, interceptor fighter, reconnaissance aircraft, etc., the MiG-31 was designed solely as an interceptor. This is how it came about. In the 1950s, aviation made huge strides forward. Aeroplanes began to fly much faster, with fighters leading the advances as ever. In the second half of the 50s, twice the speed of sound was not uncommon. At that stage, there were two types of Soviet fighter aircraft, interceptors and what you might call dogfighting aircraft. The interceptors had airborne radars, which made it possible to fly day and night missions in any weather. And those radars could also detect targets at long range. Air-to-air -air missiles were another feature. The bomber has always been one of the fighter's main targets, and it was strategic bombers that posed the greatest threat at the time. They could carry nuclear weapons over great distances. As well as speed, altitude was another key factor in the fighter-bomber battle. It was believed that the higher the bombers could fly, the less vulnerable they'd be. The B-58 Hustler strategic bomber was designed in the USA with that thought in mind. It made its maiden flight in 1956, and it could fly at more than 2,000 kilometers an hour, and its service ceiling was 19,000 meters. In 1960, the Soviet Union reacted to this bomber with the Su-9 interceptor. They were evenly matched for speed, but Su-9's service ceiling was a kilometer higher than the Hustler's. But the Hustler B-58 was only one step on the road to the faster, higher-flying bomber. In the second half of the 50s, they started work on a new strategic bomber, the B-70 Valkyrie. The Valkyrie was designed to fly at more than three times the speed of sound, 21,000 meters high. Another ambitious development was the A-12 strategic reconnaissance aircraft. That developed into the well-known SR-71 Blackbird. To this day, the Blackbird still holds two absolute aviation world records. First for altitude in horizontal flight, and the second is the speed record. That performance allowed the Blackbird to do reconnaissance missions over the USSR. The Soviets had no way to shoot down this extraordinary aeroplane. Soviet leaders became very exercised about the development of Valkyrie and Blackbird. What was needed was a fighter that could intercept the American superplanes. Second half of the 1950s, Mikoyan Design Bureau starts work on new high-speed, high-altitude interceptors. They built several prototypes, all designed as part of the Uragan automatic interception system. It means hurricane. In parallel, they needed new sophisticated ground control stations. And also, new air-to-air -air missiles. The new prototype interceptors were startlingly good. They could fly at 2.5 times the speed of sound. Their service ceiling was 22,000 meters. Both speed and altitude were world records. These new Soviet aircraft had a fantastic performance. They could reach a speed of 3,000 kilometers an hour and an altitude of 20,000 meters. 
But there were some problems. During the flight testing, it turned out that these aircraft had a serious problem with aerodynamic heating. We were short of appropriate construction materials. Also, we were restricted on fuel capacity. But if we put a bigger fuel tank in, the aircraft performance would have suffered. There was also another problem, which I would call ideological. The Uragan project was cancelled, mainly because the Soviet Union had changed its whole air defense system. The new plans called for a new interceptor with better performance and new avionics and armament. Improved combat efficiency was another requirement. The MiG-25 became that aircraft. The preliminary design of such a fighter started in 1959. In 1961, the government issued a decree approving the design of the new aircraft. On the 11th of February 1961, the general designer, Artem Mikoyan, appointed a group of experts in different specializations to carry out the design proper. There were two chief designers. Mikhail Gurevich was responsible for the airframe design and aircraft systems in general, and Nikolai Matyuk was in charge of aircraft equipment. But it wasn't long before Gurevich retired and Nikolai Matyuk became the sole chief designer for the new fighter. They planned to develop different versions of the aircraft. The separate air defense aviation arm needed an interceptor. The Air Force required a reconnaissance aircraft and they also looked into a version to carry a ballistic nuclear missile. But that got cancelled later. The MiG-25 design included a high wing, that's to say at the top of the fuselage, swept back by 42 degrees. There were two big tail fins and two ventral fins to improve the longitudinal stability at high speeds. The specifications included a service ceiling well over 20,000 meters and a maximum speed of 3,000 kilometers an hour. And that was what decided the general layout of the aircraft. The fact is that when you're near three times the speed of sound, the aircraft structure gets extremely hot. Some parts can reach a temperature of 300 degrees Celsius. At those sorts of temperatures, traditional aluminium alloys lose their strength, so you have to use steel or titanium. Indeed, the American SR-71 was mainly made of titanium. The MiG-25 structure is mostly high tensile stainless steel. We decided to use heat-resistant stainless steel. We very quickly mastered the technology and completed the manufacturing process of the fuselage and the other bits of the structure. It wasn't long before we could start actual production. Tests showed that the whole structure could withstand the kinetic heating of high speeds. Some of the structural materials were unfamiliar to the Soviet aircraft industry. They needed radical changes to the technology. With aluminium, the main way of fixing components and skin is with rivets. But for high tensile steel, you need welding. At the Electric Welding Institute, academician Boris Patona was developing unique methods for spot and arc welding. They provided the strength and structural integrity that was needed. This was distinctive technology, unique to the Soviet Union. The fuselage was welded automatically in an assembly frame. As the frame rotated with the fuselage, automated welding guns were working on it. We'd found we couldn't just set up the fuselage and start argon welding, so we fixed it inside the rotating frame. And when the argon welding was finished, all we had to do was take the fuselage out. The fuselage was an all-welded structure. It was, in fact, a huge fuel tank. Next, the outer wings, the tail units, and some other bits were attached to the aircraft fuselage. Special insulating panels had to be fitted to protect the area around the engines from overheating. The panels were silver-coated. Five kilograms of silver were used in their manufacture. 
Because of the high temperatures involved, new rubber and other sealing materials had to be specially created. And the canopy also had to be heat resistant. Special fuel was required. Unlike regular jet fuel, it was heat resistant and it could retain its properties at high temperatures. Obviously, both crew and equipment needed to operate in comfortable conditions, so efficient air conditioning and cooling systems were fitted. The R15B300 engines were developed in Sergei Tumanskaya's design bureau. They each developed 11,200 kilograms of static thrust in reheat. The R15 was designed to give maximum performance at high altitude where the air is thin. At the time it was unique, the only high altitude engine made in the Soviet Union. To optimize its performance it had an electronic fuel supply system and a three position nozzle. The engine air intakes had movable wedges which automatically regulated the airflow according to flight conditions. The global standoff between the USSR and the USA forced the politicians of both countries into quick decisions with quick results. The revolutionary MiG-25 was designed and built in just three years. When I was the assembly hall manager, Mikoyan himself, Matyuk or Gurevich would say, well, why don't you fix the problem? We want you to sort it as soon as possible. This is not good, comrade Stepanov. Don't you understand? This job is more important than anything else. The chief designers, in fact the whole Mikoyan Design Bureau, were technically very knowledgeable. They knew just what should be done and how. They knew which specialists to use to get the best results. They knew how to do tests. Artem Mikoyan set out to build cooperation with the best aircraft makers in the Soviet Union. And he succeeded. In particular, he set up good links with the Dubna engineering plant and they went on to produce parts for the first prototypes and also for the production MiG-25s. December 1963, the first prototype is delivered to Zhukovsky Aerodrome. This is a reconnaissance version of the fighter, designated Ye-155R1. 6th of March 1964, Mikoyan Design Bureau test pilot Alexander Fidotov makes the maiden flight of the Ye 155R1. I remember that day very well. We had a potential accident during that maiden flight. It was quite cold, about minus 12 degrees Celsius. Earlier, we'd installed sensors on the aircraft to test the flight systems in flight. We had a remote health checking system in the sensors, and soon after takeoff, I got a warning indication that the fuel pumps weren't working. Afterwards, it appeared that an important fuel agent hadn't been added to the aircraft tanks. It was a sort of antifreeze for kerosene. As you know, kerosene contains water, and during the flight, the water froze in the pumps. Luckily, Fedotov managed to turn back to the aerodrome and land. He was very lucky to have had enough available fuel to get back. If the flight had been longer, the engines would have been shut down. Ninth of September 1964, the Ye 155 P1 makes its maiden flight. It's the interceptor prototype, flown by test pilot Pyotr Ostapenko. You always treat a first flight like a newborn baby. I took off carefully, maneuvered the new baby round a bit, tried the engines at different settings and checked some of the new aircraft systems. I was doing it all very carefully and at subsonic speed, of course. I didn't go above 5,000 meters high. And then I slowly and carefully started my descent, came back to the aerodrome and landed. There were no serious problems in those early test stages. It is always the case with a new aeroplane that you get some minor problems, but they were solved. For example, the tests revealed a lack of directional stability at high speed. 
first they tried putting an early version of the modern winglets on the wingtips, they called them flippers, but that didn't seem to help. So instead, they enlarged the tail fins. The high temperature generated in flight was another problem. It wasn't the aircraft's structure that was suffering, but the skin. After a few flights at high speed, the Soviet Red Stars had almost disappeared. Horrors! Nobody thought much about the red paint, but obviously we had to have red stars on the plane. After several flights, you could see the stars starting to peel off the aeroplane's skin. So next, we had to develop a new heat-resistant paint. Within a couple of weeks, we'd got our new paint, and it worked. Everything was going well. Gradually, MiG-25 performance was improving. Full-scale production was arranged to be at the Gorky aircraft plant. Operational testing of the new aircraft started in 1965. There were up to 11 aircraft at a time on test at Aktubinsk, each with its own mission. There were something like 700 different specialists from different organizations. We worked as long as necessary to get to where we wanted. If the weather was good, we worked weekends. Everybody was enthusiastic. They had this feeling that this aeroplane would be a real winner. Thing is, the MiG-25 was different to anything that had gone before. With its impressive size and its strange shape, it was picking up some odd nicknames. I was working as a flying instructor. I'd never seen the MiG-25 before. But then I became a test pilot. I was looking out of the office window one day and I saw this very unusual aircraft taxiing past. I thought, what's that? The shape was so weird. I figured that any fighter with pretensions to really high speed would look more like a rocket. But this thing didn't look like a rocket at all. And to my eyes, it didn't have the right shape to achieve good aerodynamic performance. So I said to a colleague standing next to me, what's that? He said, that's a phantom. I didn't get the joke. I thought he was serious. But huge air intakes, wide fuselage, two tail fins, two great big jet nozzles, everything looked quite wrong to me. In July 1967, it was decided that the MiG-25 should take part in an official flypast at Domodedovo, even though operational testing hadn't been finished. It was part of the 50th anniversary celebrations of the October Revolution. A loose formation of MiG-25s flew over the aerodrome in front of the distinguished guests. The new shape in the sky caused a sensation. One of those aeroplanes was flown by military test pilot Igor Lishnikov. Three and a half months later, on the 30th of October, Igor Lishnikov set out to break a time-to-height record with the MiG-25. After takeoff, he accelerated the aircraft in reheat and started a high-speed climb. He quickly exceeded the speed limitation. At altitude 1,000 meters, the aircraft started banking to the left. Lishnikov tried to correct the uncommanded bank with a right movement of the control column. But he was going too fast, and the result was what's called aileron reversal. Lishnikov's stick movement to the right caused an even bigger bank to the left. The aeroplane began a steepening dive. Igor Lishnikov managed to eject, but because of his high vertical speed and low altitude, he had no chance. He didn't survive. The lack of effectiveness of the flying controls remained a problem during missile testing as well. After a missile launch from an outer wing hardpoint, the aircraft would sometimes roll on its back and dive steeply. Military test pilot Nureyo Kazarian was the first one to experience this. Immediately after a missile launch, the aircraft zoomed and started rolling over. I pushed the control column the opposite way and tried to recover the aircraft, but it didn't respond. It continued rolling and began to dive almost vertically. I still had no control. The aircraft was diving very fast. Only at an altitude of 12,000 meters did it start very gradually responding to the controls. 
At 10,000 meters, I finally got it under control and started leveling out. Eventually, I got it level and turned towards the aerodrome. A missile launch had never caused such an upset before. It was a big problem and it had to be solved. Big changes had to be made to the aircraft control system. In addition to ailerons on the wings, tailerons were fitted on the tail, and that greatly improved the roll control. When missiles were launched, the tailerons engaged automatically and stopped the aircraft rolling. There was another tragic accident to the MiG-25 in 1969. On the 28th of April, the Air Defense Aircraft Commander-in-Chief, Lieutenant General Anatoly Kadamsov, was killed during a familiarization flight. The cause was an engine fire. Artem Mikoyan himself became personally involved in the crash investigation. As chief designer, he was very upset about the tragedy. A month after Kadamsov's death, Mikoyan had a heart attack. He never recovered. The great Artem Mikoyan died on the 9th of December 1970. Operational testing on the reconnaissance aircraft and the interceptor was completed in 1969 and 1970, respectively. The interceptor was designated MiG-25P and the reconnaissance aircraft MiG-25R. They became operational in combat units in the early 70s. Single-seat MiG-25P interceptor. Length 19.75 meters. Height 6.5 meters. Wingspan 14 meters. Maximum takeoff weight 36,720 kilograms. Maximum flight speed 3,000 kilometers an hour. Service ceiling 20,700 meters. Range 1,730 kilometers. The reconnaissance version had increased range and a higher ceiling. There was a twin-seat version of the aeroplane for pilot training. Both the reconnaissance aircraft and the interceptor had their own twin-seat versions. The instructor sat in the front cockpit, the trainee behind. Pilots mastered the MiG-25 very quickly. Most Soviet military pilots yearned to fly this aeroplane. After all, it was the fastest and highest in the Soviet Union. When you select reheat for takeoff and you feel the fierce acceleration, the MiG-25 seems to come alive. The faster it flies, the easier it is to control. You go faster and faster, and then at some stage, you suddenly feel on top of the world. It's a great feeling. I can't even begin to describe it. I only ever had that feeling when I flew the MiG-25. The MiG-25 was designed to fly very high, 20,000 meters, say. The upper atmosphere was its real home. It wasn't much good at low level. No, the top of the atmosphere was where the MiG-25 felt great. Military pilots were not allowed to exceed 3,000 kilometers an hour on the MiG-25. That's roughly Mach 2.83. But during test flights, they achieved speeds higher than that. General designer Artem Mikoyan signed a special order and it became an official document. In it, he ordered me to make six flights and achieve Mach 3. That's 3,200 kilometers an hour. As well as the MiG-25's extraordinary performance figures, there was another thing that endeared it to pilots and technicians alike. The air conditioning system used a mixture of water and alcohol. It took 240 liters of this unlikely liquid. At supersonic speeds, the alcohol would evaporate and cool various components. 240 liters of pure alcohol mixed with distilled water is a lot, and that's why the MiG-25 was jokingly referred to as the booze carrier. After flight, some of the remaining liquid would miraculously disappear. People call it masandre. It was a Crimean wine. Artem Mikoyan was a wine lover, and he thought it was a great joke.
Quite unexpectedly, bad news started coming in from Air Force regiments. They reported sudden loss of aircraft control at low altitudes and at speeds greater than a thousand kilometers an hour. In 1973, MiG-25s were being lost one by one. Pilots too. But nobody knew why it was happening. First one accident and then another. And then one day, a pilot managed to save his aircraft. It was delivered to the Flight Research Institute at Zhukovsky. We tested it for a long time, but we still couldn't find any reason for the failures. Everything seemed to be working fine. The Zhukovsky Flight Research Institute was pouring resources into the problem, including test pilots Leonid Rybakov and Oleg Gutkov. They tried to replicate the regiment pilot's loss of control, but it wasn't easy. The aeroplane behaved quite normally. 4th of October 1973, Oleg Gutkov is scheduled to make the final flight in the test series. The plan is to do eight high-speed flypasts at different altitudes, stirring the control column a little. He does that, but everything stays within expected limits. Before he lands, Gutkov decides to do another high-speed flypast. Altitude 1500 meters, speed 1100 kilometers an hour. Suddenly there he is, the MiG starts rolling wildly. Calmly, Gutkov calls on the radio, it's rolling, it's rolling. Those were his last words. The aeroplane crashed in the town of Remenskaya in the Moscow region. The only fatality was Gutkov. The aircraft hit the ground so hard, the engine broke in pieces. Oleg Gutkov paid with his life to find the reason for these failures. His loss of control took place at a critical moment within a narrow range of speed and altitude, that is, at a certain airflow pressure. It had been really difficult to find what the problem was. You just didn't know where to start troubleshooting. Well, at least we hadn't known until Gutkov's death. When the anomaly had started happening, Gutkov had said over the radio that his aircraft had started to roll and he wasn't able to control it. That roll was the key to solving the problem. We realized there was something wrong with the tail unit. This was what it was. We talked earlier about the MiG-25 having tailorons. The sections of the tailorons on either side could move in opposite directions. But at a particular speed and altitude, if the pilot slightly stirred the control column, one of the tailor-on sections would jam. The hydraulic actuator wasn't able to return the section back to its proper position. Suddenly, the pilot couldn't move the control column. The airplane would start an uncontrollable roll at low altitude, often with fatal results. The answer was simple. Move the tailor-on axis forward by 14 centimeters. The regiments that flew the MiG-25 interceptors were structurally a part of air defense aircraft. That in turn was part of the air defense system of the country. Parked on their special stands, aircraft were on standby day and night. The standby pilots ran to their cockpits and took off for their interception. The interception line was 600 kilometers. The interceptors were guided to their targets by ground-based radars. The operator would enter the target and the interceptors into a targeting channel. The equipment would then track the enemy and transfer the targeting data to the aircraft. There were two options. In one, instrument panel indicators would show the pilot the direction to the target. That was called direct targeting. And in the second, everything was automatic. Pilots didn't have to do anything. At a certain range from the target, the interceptor's radar would take over the targeting. Air target detected, closing range. The MiG-25P had the Smirch A radar system that had been developed by a design team led by Fyodor Volkov. The radar could detect a target 100 kilometers away. At 60 kilometers, the target would be locked on and the radar would start auto-tracking.
the MiG-25P could carry four R-40 missiles. In fact, they were the interceptor's only weapon system. The R-40 had been designed by Martusa Biznovat. The R-40 was actually quite big and heavy, at 6 meters long and weighing in at 470 kilograms. There were two versions, one with a heat-seeking head and the other with a radar homing head. The launch range of the R-40 was 30 kilometers. The MiG-25P could hit a target flying at any altitude between 500 and 27,000 meters and at a speed as high as 3,200 kilometers an hour. The attack in the front hemisphere, that's to say head-on, was a particular challenge. The interceptor's closing speed on the target could be as much as one and a half kilometers a second. The pilot had just a few brief moments for firing. When I was approaching the point where I would need to launch a missile, I would operate the launch trigger some way in advance. And then, after the aircraft radar had locked onto the target, the missiles would be launched automatically. It became clear after a while that the capability of the MiG-25P had a significant impact on U.S. military plans. High and fast direct penetration by American aircraft had become impractical. The Valkyrie strategic bomber progressed no further than experimental status, and the SR-71 reconnaissance aeroplane found itself with serious opposition. The SR-71 was absolutely not an aircraft for large number production either in technological terms or in the numbers required for operations. In fact, there were only ever about 30 of them, and the pilots were required to be of test pilot status. The crew were kitted out like astronauts. It took about 24 hours to prepare the aeroplane for flight. By contrast, the MiG-25 was always on alert, ready to take off for combat within two minutes, flown by regular military pilots. About a thousand MiG-25 aircraft were produced. Let's take a look at the reconnaissance version now. The MiG-25R was delivered to frontal aviation units of the Air Force. But this reconnaissance version was not to be around for long. In 1969, word came from the top that the R version was to be modified to become a reconnaissance bomber. The MiG-25RB could carry up to 10 500 kilogram bombs. The bomb aiming and navigation system was called Peleng. Most of the time I flew the RB version of the MiG-25. We used that for testing the Peleng bomb aiming and navigation system. I'd enter the coordinates of the target into the system and the aircraft would navigate itself to the bomb release point. It was completely automatic. I didn't have to do anything except, of course, monitor the whole thing. Well, actually, I did have one task. The system would give me the command attention, release, and I would push the bomb release button. That way, the pilot would be making the final decision as to whether to drop the bomb or not. Normal bombing mode, altitude 20,000 meters, speed 2,500 kilometers an hour. At our cruising speed of Mach 2.3, we'd drop our bombs at 42 kilometers range from the target. Although the bombs would slow down as they fell, they'd still be supersonic at the moment of impact, and they would sometimes penetrate the ground to a depth of 30 to 40 meters. In the reconnaissance role, there were three main versions of the aeroplane photographic reconnaissance, electronic reconnaissance, and radar surveillance. The military conflicts in the Middle East provided real combat experience for the MiG-25RB. In the spring of 1971, five aircraft and crews left the Soviet Union for Egypt. There was to be no bombing, but reconnaissance missions were carried out to perfection. It was a highly effective detachment. The Egyptian headquarters staff showed us the maps that supported their plan for dealing with the military situation around the Suez Canal. But after our flights, it was clear that the maps were wrong. 
The MiG-25 RB flew over occupied Sinai and over Israel. Sorties were flown at more than 20,000 meters altitude and speeds up to 3,000 kilometers an hour. The aircraft equipment produced high quality images with the finest definition. I was surprised by the detail. The altitude was more than 20,000 meters and on the Fayum lake shore I could see boats and I could see the oars in some of them. The oars were not lying in the boat but being used on the water. It was all clearly visible. Israeli fighters repeatedly took off to intercept the MiG-25 RBs, but they didn't get close. The Hawk surface-to-air missile system couldn't hit them either. The third or fourth flight was along the Suez Canal. It was over Egyptian territory, but still close to the canal and to the Israeli occupying forces. Our systems detected that, at that moment, there were 48 fighters airborne and out to intercept my plane. But they couldn't make it any higher than 15 to 15 and a half thousand meters. We were at more than 20,000 meters. The arrival of the MiG-25 reconnaissance aircraft opened a whole new era in Soviet reconnaissance. The aircraft could cover huge areas. It offered pinpoint accuracy in defining the coordinates of targets, and it could then transmit that data in real time. And all this was happening so high and so fast that no other aircraft could stop it. The history of the MiG-25 is illuminated by bright splashes of world achievements. At various times, MiG-25s have set about 40 world records. Some of them remained unbroken for many years. A MiG-25M still holds the absolute altitude record for a jet aircraft, 37,650 meters. That was set by Alexander Fidotov on the 31st of August, 1977. With the creation of the MiG-25, the Soviet Union became strong as a great aviation power. And the Mikoyan Design Bureau gained invaluable experience in designing high-speed, high-altitude aircraft. In the 1970s, the MiG-25 successfully fulfilled everything it was asked to do. But then, more complex missions started appearing. The Mikoyan Design Bureau, along with the developers of avionics equipment, armament and engines, were called on to climb new summits. By the mid-1970s, the MiG-25 had achieved credible worldwide recognition. It had become a source of some concern to potential enemies of the Soviet Union. Foxbat was the code name NATO gave to the MiG-25 interceptor. Foreign intelligence agencies were desperate for anything they could get on this new Soviet aircraft. Any information was gratefully received. The Cold War was actually a hotbed of espionage activities and minor political and military incidents. One famous episode during East-West confrontation happened in 1976. The MiG-25 found itself the focus of worldwide attention. On the 6th of September 1976, Senior Lieutenant Viktor Bilyenka hijacked the top-secret fighter to Japan. He flew the MiG-25 from the Russian Far East Aerodrome at Chukwiovka to Hakodate Civil Airport in Japan. Along with the aircraft, the Japanese got access to the top secret Soviet IFF codes, that's identification friend or foe, and other Soviet military secrets. At first we thought some sort of accident had happened to the MiG-25. It never occurred to us that it could have been hijacked but we soon realized it was a case of treachery. To be honest, behavior like that from a Soviet citizen left a bad taste in the mouth. It was a nasty thing to do. It was very hard for me as a pilot to accept that one of my colleagues could do such an awful thing. I mean, he hijacked our Soviet interceptor, the best in the world at the time. The Air Force had just begun to get hold of these aeroplanes. People were excited about this interceptor that had been designed and developed and successfully tested and finally built. Our military pilots were just getting used to it. The guy was a jerk. He didn't care about his country. He was a man with no feelings for his people or for his motherland. 
The Soviet Union demanded that the aircraft and the pilot be returned, but the United States granted Viktor Bilyenka political asylum. Eventually, under pressure, the Japanese had to give the MiG-25 to the Soviet Union, but not before they and the Americans had examined it in minute detail. The aircraft was covered all over with technical information about it, all translated into Japanese words and characters. They also sampled each turbine and compressor blade from the engine. They took the canopy apart because they wanted to understand how the canopy plexiglass could withstand the great heat produced at high speed and high altitude. They drilled holes in primary aircraft parts to investigate the metal characteristics. And when we got the aircraft back, we found American-made circuit breakers installed in it. Apparently, they tried some tests on various bits of equipment, but they blew it. We still don't know why Viktor Bilyenka hijacked the aircraft. Was it a setup by American intelligence? Or was it just that Bilyenka wanted a better life abroad? Whatever the reason, it put the defense capacity of the Soviet Union under great stress. That was critical. In the Soviet Union, the hijacking did speed up the further development of the aircraft. Not only that, but the Mikoyan Design Bureau started work on the new MiG-31 interceptor. Simultaneously, MiG-25 modernization was proceeding apace. A new version was called MiG-25PD, PD being the Russian abbreviation for Upgraded Interceptor. Everybody knew that the hijacked MiG-25 had been minutely examined by foreign experts. So the Soviet Union decided on changes to the armament system, the IFF friend or foe codes, and other things. And of course, the current aircraft systems had to be replaced with new ones. It wasn't easy, but what else could we do? First of all, they changed the aircraft detection system. The new Sapphire 25 airborne interception radar was installed. It could detect low-level airborne targets. That had become necessary with changing threats. It had previously been the case that bombers would fly as high as possible to avoid an enemy's air defense systems. As anti-aircraft missiles developed, that had to change. The bombers began to fly low. Now, attacking aircraft became very hard to track, either with ground or airborne radars. Earlier MiG-25s couldn't detect a target flying less than 500 meters above ground because of the ground reflection effect. The MiG-25 PD radar could detect a target flying at only 50 meters above the ground. The maximum target range also improved. The PD could hit a target flying as high as 30,000 meters. That was a 3,000 meter improvement on its predecessor's capability. The new detection system now included infrared sensors. An airborne target could now be detected without emitting radar signals. Detection range was shorter with infrared, but the pilot could avoid illuminating his target with radar and thus alerting it. The R-40 missiles were improved and the R-60 short-range missiles were added to the aircraft armament system. Actually, this upgrade was like a whole new life for the aircraft. It was a big improvement. All the armament was changed, new radars were installed, and the overall aircraft performance increased significantly. About 150 MiG-25 PDs were built, and in fact, all the previous MiG-25 interceptors were also upgraded. They were called MiG-25 PDS, the S meaning upgraded in service. There was another upgrade version, and that was called MiG-25BM. It was a specially developed anti-radar version. About 40 of them were built. The total production of all the upgraded MiG-25s amounted to 1,200 aircraft in all. I would say the MiG-25 was essential for the Soviet Union. 
but also for world aviation. It was absolutely an achievement with great aerodynamics and a superb power plant, very advanced for its time. The new approach had required so many problems to be solved by the designers and engineers. This aircraft really boosted advanced technologies in the Soviet aviation industry. In the 1970s, the Soviet Union was accelerating technologically, particularly in aviation. I think that was an achievement for the whole Soviet people. The MiG-25 was a world great in the history of aviation. It went into service at the peak of the Cold War, and it turned into a symbol of Soviet advanced technology. It set a world altitude record in 1977, and 36 years later, in the second decade of the 21st century, that record holds. Not only that, but the MiG-25 remains the fastest Russian aircraft ever built. You might ask, why didn't they build an even faster aeroplane after the MiG-25? Well, the race for aeronautical speed slowed down significantly when they got to three times the speed of sound. Although there are still a few research bureaus where they're looking at hypersonic speeds, it seems likely that the objective will be just too expensive for manned flight. So the plan changed to concentrating on improving aircraft equipment and armament rather than continuing the competition for speed. And that's where the story of the MiG-31 interceptor begins. During the Cold War, the air defense of the northern and far eastern regions of the Soviet Union was extremely difficult. The severe climate made ground-based radars virtually impracticable. It wasn't even particularly easy to establish the necessary wide network of airfields. Hence the requirement for a long-range interceptor. During the 1960s and 70s, the Tupolev 128 was the only long-range interceptor in the Soviet Union. It was a 1950s design. Neither its equipment nor its armament met the new requirements, to say nothing of its speed and altitude capabilities. The MiG outperformed the Tupolev in many respects, but it was not a long-range interceptor. This was when new attack tactics were coming in, Aircraft would fly at very low level to get through the air defences. Another problem to solve. Cruise missiles were yet another threat. Their low-level terrain following was a new capability at the time. Tracking and destroying these comparatively small flying weapons was extremely hard. So the new interceptor needed very long range. But most of all, it had to be a product of new ideology. The MiG-31 concept derived from the MiG-25 interceptor and all of its operational experience. We needed better range and better altitude than the MiG-25 offered. We specially needed an aircraft that was faster at low level. Also, we were looking for new radar and new missiles. The missiles had to be extra long range. It was common knowledge that the MiG-25 could track only one target at a time, one by one as we say. The new interceptor had to have multiple target tracking. But one aircraft standing against a whole horde of attacking aircraft or missiles would not be enough. The whole concept had to be changed. The new idea was to use interceptors in a group. Command and control and direction would be provided by special data transmission equipment. The designers started developing the MiG-31 in 1968. Gleb Lazino Lazinskia was appointed chief designer. He was replaced after eight years in 1976 by Konstantin Vasilchenko. The MiG-31 project was known in the factory as E-155MP. That harked back to the MiG-25's factory code E-155. In Russian, those letters MP stand for multi-role interceptor. The general layout of the new MiG-31 was quite like its predecessor, MiG-25. The new aeroplane had two engines, two tail fins, a moderate sweep tapered wing, and side air intakes with a wedge shape. However, 
layout was the only thing the two had in common. The MiG-31 was, in fact, a different aeroplane. The MiG-31 became the first Soviet fighter to be powered by bypass turbojets. Among other things, the bypass was more fuel efficient in dry thrust, that's to say without reheat in operation. And the new engine was smaller, which allowed extra space for fuel tanks. This new power plant was developed in the design bureau headed by Pavel Solovyev. It was the D30 F6 engine, and at maximum power in reheat, the combined thrust of two of them was 31 tons. The leading edge root extensions on the front of the wing improve maneuverability at high angles of attack. There's also an advanced flap system that increases lift at lower speeds. The MiG-31 has an endurance on continuous patrol of three and a half hours. That's almost double the MiG-25s. And in case you should think we're making demeaning comparisons with the MiG-25, well, it's not that at all. It is, in fact, a way to better understand the impressive development of the MiG-31. Overall, you could say these aircraft have similar maximums of speed and altitude but the MiG-31 is much more combat capable. The MiG-31 has a two-person crew, pilot and navigator weapon systems operator, or WIZO. Second cockpit behind the pilot has a big screen for displaying the tactical situation. Originally, the designers expected that with the pilot in front, the seat behind him would be occupied by a group commander, and that group commander was to be a general. The thinking was that these groups of aircraft would be employed for very important strategic missions. And important missions had to be under the control of a general. But further mature consideration and research suggested that what the successful prosecution of the strategic mission really needed, instead of a general on board, was simply a good navigator weapons systems operator. During combat missions, each crew member has his own part to play. The aircraft commander flies the aircraft, launches missiles, fires the cannon and makes final decisions in all sorts of different situations. The control column has a trimmer switch. It's there to reduce the load for the pilot when he's maneuvering. This one returns the aircraft to the horizon and the radio communication button is next to it. This is the brake lever both for the nose and the main wheels and also the buttons to launch the missiles and fire the cannon. Conventionally the throttles are on the left, two engines hence two throttles. Their positions can be secure position, idle power, maximum power, minimum reheat and full reheat. The navigator plots tracks, continually corrects them when required, and ensures the appropriate readiness for combat. The navigator, who's also the WIZO, can also fly the aircraft. So there's a pair of throttles in the second cockpit too. And here's how the extending control column pulls up when you need it. The weapons control system of the new fighter was called Zaslon, a barrier in Russian. The core of the system is the radar with a phased antenna array. This system was designed in the Tikhomirov Scientific Research Institute for Instrument Design. Earlier generations of radar had mechanical moving antennae. A phased antenna radar scans electronically without the head having to move. Electronic scanning provides a whole picture almost instantaneously. And not only that, but the phased array radar can provide coordinates for several targets at the same time. So the MiG-25 radar could only track one target. The MiG-31 radar can track ten targets simultaneously. The associated computer helps identify which are the most dangerous. It can detect targets out to 200 kilometers. 
The Zaslon system was pivotal to the MiG-31's operation. It detected and tracked targets, and it authenticated the weapon's lock-on to targets. As crew commander and pilot, all I had to do was put the marker on the targets in the display and then choose a maneuver, left, up, right, down, fly this way, that way, anything really. So basically, I just aligned the marks on the display and pushed the button. And that was that. The MiG-31 is the first interceptor capable of attacking several targets at once, including cruise missiles flying at low level. Four missiles can be launched in one attack against four different targets. I was on a training sortie. I knew there were four airborne targets somewhere up ahead, had to shoot at them. I'm just sitting there looking around, nothing much to do. I think to myself, well, there's that Wizzo behind me. He's the guy who's supposed to find the targets. I'll just hang loose till then. So I say to him, how are you doing, mate? How's the work going? He says, what work? I'm asleep. Asleep? You've got to be joking. So who's doing the work? He says, the Zaslon's doing it. It's in automatic. So I relax a bit. Soon the first target pops up on my display. I put the mark on it and launch a missile. A few seconds later, there's the second. Another missile. Bang! Both targets hit within seconds. Then the third and the fourth come up. In just ten seconds, I've launched four missiles. Four targets hit. The navigator says, OK, boss, mission complete. Targets destroyed. We're off home. The MiG-31 became the first fighter in the world with such a phased array radar. It remained ahead for quite a while because Western fighters didn't catch up till nearly two decades later. This fighter can also do its stuff in standalone mode, that's to say without help from ground radars. The encrypted data transmission system on the aircraft is said to be jam-proof. It allows several fighters to transmit the air situation to each other and to ground facilities as well. A group of four aircraft can scan an airborne area up to 900 kilometers wide. The Zaslon system in the lead aircraft interacts with the systems in the other aircraft. When a target is detected, it's the lead aircraft commander who makes the final decision. With multiple targets, he assigns targets to particular aircraft, including, of course, himself. In other words, the leading aircraft is responsible for target distribution. The MiG-31 can also be the leading aircraft for different fighter types, often, for instance, with a group of Su-27s. It also has an infrared search and track, IRST, system with a detection range of 40 kilometers. The MiG-31 first prototype was built in summer 1975 and flight testing began in the autumn. 16th of September 1975, the MiG-31 interceptor made its maiden flight, carrying ID number 831. The test pilot for this momentous occasion was Alexandra Fidotov. At the time of this maiden flight, Alexandra Fedotov was already a distinguished test pilot of the USSR and a hero of the Soviet Union. He'd been working for the Mikoyan Design Bureau as chief pilot for 22 years. Fedotov had set a lot of the world records. He was the man who flew the maiden flight of the MiG-23, the MiG-25 and the MiG-29. For his work on the MiG-31, he was awarded the Lenin Prize. MiG-31 turned out to be Alexandra Fedotov's last maiden flight. On the 4th of April 1984, Fedotov and test navigator weapon systems operator Valery Zaitsev were flying the interceptor. It was a routine test flight to check the aircraft after scheduled maintenance. A few minutes after takeoff, a warning came on indicating they were running very low on fuel. Fedotov decided to abort the flight and turned back towards the aerodrome. Flying back inbound, he asked air traffic control to look behind the aircraft to see if there was any trail of leaking fuel. There was none. 
All the while, the situation was getting worse. The warning system was now indicating that the fuel level was critically low. Vidotov made the decision to land as soon as possible. He started his descent and turned hard onto the runway heading. The maneuver was perfectly appropriate for an empty MiG-31, but the aircraft wasn't empty. The system had been giving false warnings. The fuel tanks were almost full, and the aircraft was too heavy to sustain the turn. Vidotov tried to recover, but he was too low. They had no chance. Alexandra Fedotov and Valery Zaitsev both died. The warning system played a dirty trick on them. Had it been a failure of the transducer so that all the lights lit up at the same time, Fedotov would have realized that there wasn't a leak and the tanks weren't empty. But the warnings came on progressively, one by one, just as if the tanks were actually emptying. His speed and height on approach were a bit higher than you'd want for a normal landing, so he decided to make a hard turn to significantly reduce his speed. He thought that the aircraft had lost at least 10 tons of fuel, but it hadn't. It was too heavy, and it flicked. Such was the fate of the men. One moment they were alive, they could still speak, they were still thinking. But nothing could be done to save them. Even if they ejected from the aircraft, they would not have been high enough. We were at the test airfield at Aktubinsk when the terrible news came through. For hours, I just couldn't believe it. I thought it must be a mistake. I was waiting for them to tell me that everything was fine. I just couldn't believe it. Well, the next day we were ferrying two MiG-25s over there. As we turned on finals for the runway, I saw where Fidotov had crashed. It was only then that I finally realized he was really gone. You might say that the sky always takes the best men. With Fidotov, many people say that God took him away. God always takes the best. MiG-31 fighters went into operational service in May 1981. They were delivered to the Soviet Air Force in large numbers in the first half of the 80s. By the end of the decade, MiG-31s were based at more than 20 aerodromes across the vast territory of the Soviet Union. MiG-31 two-seat interceptor. Length 22.7 meters. Height 6.15 meters. Wingspan, 13.46 meters. Maximum takeoff weight, 46,200 kilograms. Maximum speed, 3,000 kilometers per hour. Operating ceiling, 20,600 meters. Range, 3,000 kilometers. The MiG-31 is pretty big and heavy. With its takeoff weight of significantly more than 40 tons, it's more like a ship than a fighter. The MiG-31 replaced a number of older interceptor fighters with lesser combat capabilities. The crews had to get used to long distance flights which required them to be specially qualified. Also, these patrols were sometimes over the waters of the Arctic Ocean. That added extra stress for the crews. When you're flying the MiG-31, there's no time to relax. Constant vigilance is essential whenever you're on board, you know. It sometimes surprises pilots with plenty of experience in other types of aircraft when they fly the MiG-31 for the first time. I heard one of them say that when you take off in the MiG-31, you breathe in and you don't breathe out until you've landed. I came across it in 1992. I still remember my first flight. I'll never forget it. It engenders very strong emotions. Well, it's the aeroplane itself. It's a bit like a ship. Flying this aeroplane makes you very proud. It's a great feeling when you're in control of a fighter that weighs nearly 50 tons with all its armament. It's a splendid aeroplane. The MiG-31's weaponry includes four R-33 long-range missiles carried under the fuselage. 
The R-33 can hit high-speed targets up to 120 kilometers away. And those targets can be at heights of anything between 25 meters and 28,000 meters. The MiG-31 also carries up to four R-60 short-range missiles or two R-40 medium-range missiles on the underwing pylons. And there's also a six-barrel GSH-623 cannon with 260 rounds of 23mm ammunition. Cannons mounted in the fairing behind the starboard main undercarriage bay. The NATO code name for the MiG-31 is Foxhound. Like any advanced military aircraft, Foxhound was kept secret from foreign intelligence investigations. But sometimes, even the best kept secret eventually comes to light. In 1985, the KGB arrested a man who worked for one of the Soviet Defense Institutes called Adolf Tolkachev. Soon became clear that he had passed information on the MiG-29 and MiG-31 weapon systems to the West. So a decision was taken to modify the MiG-31 and in particular its weapon systems. The new modifications included an upgraded radar and upgraded R-33 missiles. The new version of the fighter was called MiG-31B. It also sported a new in-flight refueling system that significantly increased its flight endurance and enlarged its interception zone. That was particularly important when the fighter was patrolling the northern borders of the country. On the 30th of July 1987, test pilot Roman Tuskayev and test navigator Wizzo Leonid Popov flew a fighter interceptor over the North Pole. It was a global first. The flight took six and a half hours and they were refueled twice from air tankers. The MiG-25 had also been expected to get an air refueling system, but eventually the idea was turned down and they only ever got as far as flight tests. By the beginning of the 90s, about 500 MiG-31 interceptors had been produced in various versions. And a new aircraft, the MiG-31M, was about to go into production. The cockpits and the computerized flight systems had been upgraded. It carried more fuel. Various modifications had been incorporated that improved the aircraft performance. There were new engines offering greater fuel efficiency and more power. In fact, you could hardly call the aeroplane a MiG-31 because it was actually better in nearly all respects than the MiG-31. The Zaslon M weapons control system could track 24 targets and attack six of them simultaneously. There were six long-range missiles under the fuselage, up from four. Target detection range, and indeed the range of the missiles themselves, were significantly better. But actually, those very long-range missile launches never happened. We didn't do them from our aircraft, and neither did our, shall we say, putative enemies launch them from theirs. As was often the case at that time in the 1990s, a prospective development program was halted. The aeroplane didn't satisfy all the official tests. The technological experience of developing the M version proved useful in the further development of existing MiG-31s. Of course, they weren't as capable overall as the full M version, but it was at least a step forward. The first upgraded aircraft, now called MiG-31BM, went into Air Force service in 2008. Keeping up with worldwide fashion, both cockpits now boasted multifunction displays. A satellite navigation system was fitted. Number of weapons hard points under the wing was increased from two to four. The aeroplane's combat efficiency was boosted by almost four times for some operational capabilities. This is Savaslejka Air Base. It's in the Nizhny Novgorod region where most of the MiG-31 interceptors are stationed. 
The maintenance squadron is here, where the aircraft get periodic checks and regular planned maintenance. It's here that all the various systems and bits of the aircraft can be checked. Engines can be replaced, snags can be fixed. One of the unusual features of the MiG-31 is the strange undercarriage design. The aircraft was heavy enough to need a four-wheeled main undercarriage. This layout reduces the load on runway surfaces and actually makes it possible to operate the aircraft on ice airfields. The MiG-31 flight simulator is used for training and the continuing improvement of flight skills. For instance, it trains crews in reacting to in-flight emergencies. During this pre-flight briefing, the Air Force unit commander assigns crews to different missions and receives readiness reports. The crews are briefed on weather conditions and forecasts, diversion airfields and many other details of the planned flights. They do a run-through of the flight before they even get to their aeroplanes. Technicians prepare the aeroplanes on special parking stands. They fuel the tanks with kerosene and charge the oxygen and nitrogen tanks. As a matter of interest, the compressed nitrogen is used for opening and closing the canopies. Before they climb in, the crews do a walk-round visual inspection. Once the engines are started, they check the aircraft systems with the technician in constant communication with the crew. Taxi to the runway. They usually take off in full reheat. These days, the MiG-31 is a most powerful interceptor aircraft, comparable in many respects to the American fifth-generation fighter, the F-22. Today, the Americans recognize that if there is one aircraft to compare with the F-22, it is the MiG-31. First of all, it's got a more powerful radar. And secondly, its missiles have a bigger payload and better range than the missiles on the F-22. The MiG-31 is faster than the F-22. Its dynamic field of interception is greater. The MiG-31 is in fact the most versatile interceptor with the best abilities in target interception. This is an extremely powerful weapons system. Also, MiG-31 interceptors work well in a group, sharing all their data with each other. A MiG-31 group provides the perfect area defense. I'd like this aircraft to keep soldiering on, to keep being updated. But a lot of people complain that it's very expensive. The fuel price is high. The price of the airplane itself is high. Today, everything's money. But you have to realize, if you want a good thing, you have to pay good money. Because this airplane fulfills the missions that other aircraft can't manage. Pay the proper attention to it, and then the MiG-31 will live long. The MiG-25 and the MiG-31 were landmark aeroplanes in world aviation. Each of them was at the forefront of scientific and technological progress in its time. They were revolutionary in so many ways. Without any doubt, it was a breakthrough. When the MiG-25 was created, it was an extraordinary breakthrough. We achieved those speeds, those heights. It was a really powerful breakthrough. And from that base, we created the amazing MiG-31. Speed and everything else were kept the same, but we definitely improved the combat capabilities. This is an aircraft of the highest performance. All of this MiG-25 and MiG-31 family of aeroplanes have very high potential. 
It's a good, long-term platform for fulfilling different tasks. All of these new features of the MiG-31 have such great potential that it is too early to predict where it'll all end. The potential is nowhere near exhausted yet. As of 2012, the MiG-25RB reconnaissance bombers continue to serve the Russian Air Force. The MiG-25 interceptors have been superseded by the more advanced MiG-31, and the potential of that aeroplane is huge. There is no doubt that this interceptor will be successfully protecting Russian air borders for many years to come.